Okay, I have noon on my time, so we will get started. I see we have a few more participants uh, funneling in as time goes on. So thank you everyone for joining us. This is our third webinar in the Transition Thursday webinar series. And for this one, we are extremely excited to be joined by not one, but by two national award-winning extension educators who helped to create the Woodlands Transition Program. And through that, uh, they've been working with that program since uh, 2007 and really are here to talk today about family communication and heritage. Uh, Becky has been with the University of Minnesota for I believe 27 years um, and has been working with uh, communication and helping folks to develop um, and be able to better speak within families. Mike is part of our forestry program um, and he too has been with the university for quite some time. So we are so excited to be joined uh, by both of them today. If you wanna to advance to the next slide, please. Just as a reminder, this is part of a webinar series. Uh, we will pick back up, uh, not next Thursday, because that is Thanksgiving. So hopefully all of you can enjoy a nice meal, um, but we'll be picking back up December 3rd with business structures and land ownership. As always, I send out an email morning of with that link. Um, so we hope to see you there. In December, we'll be talking about business structures and then estate planning. Next slide. We'll just go over this briefly each meeting to make sure that we all have the same uh, knowledge. The mute and unmute button is uh, number one. You'll see this bar at the bottom of your screen. Feel free, uh, that allows you to mute and unmute. Uh, two is your camera. We love to see faces. We don't see enough faces nowadays. Uh, so if you'd like, you're more than welcome to turn your camera on. Three is your chat uh, bar. This allows us to chat back and forth. If you have questions, you can place them in there. Mike will be using the chat bar throughout their presentation. Um, and this also, if you have any tech issues that arise, please put them in there. More than happy to help resolve those. And then four, that is the end meeting button. Next slide, please. And with that, I will turn it over to our presenters today. Mike and Becky, thank you so much for being here. Okay, Amber, thank, thank you very much. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I welcome everybody. It looks like we've got about 28 participants and that's great. Um, I have worked with Becky on helping teach communication mainly with with uh, forest landowners since 2007, as Amber had said. Um, we're very pleased to be here today and have been working with the farm transition team for about two years um, and excited about that. What I hope you do today is go ahead and ask questions throughout. Um, we've given you a little bit of background about uh, Becky and I, I'll give you a little bit more, Becky, and then Becky, I'll let you go ahead and say a few words. But um, I uh, come from originally the Chicago area. Uh, we have, the family has land in Southern Illinois, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, I spent several years in the state of Oregon, um, two different times, but have always gravitated back to the Midwest. Um, moved back here to, to work in forestry extension in 1999. I was with Oregon State University for a while. Um, and throughout my career, I have, I have mainly been in the forestry side of things. So Becky, um, why don't you give a little bit more background on, on yourself? Yes, thank you, Mike. And I'm Becky higgins Jokla, and my focus area has been in family resiliency and specifically in financial education. So a lot of my work has been to work with agencies and individuals and financial management education and tools to um, help as they seek out forming their budgets and, and just in general. I also have worked in the area of nutrition in the past and various other um, focal areas. And as was mentioned, since 2007, uh, Mike and I have been teaming with the intergenerational land transfer work where I've been 
focusing on the family communication piece. And so happy to have you here today. Um, I might mention my regional office was in Cloquet, and now of course we're working remotely, so a little bit different um, work plan there. But glad you're here today. Okay, thank you, Becky. I'll go ahead through and talk about, uh, just let you know what we're gonna talk about uh, over the next uh, 30 minutes or 35 minutes or so. Um, there'll be a short video kind of, uh, that introduces this topic um, and why communication is important. Um, we'll go through, Becky will go through some communication tools, uh, give a presentation. Um, there will be, I will give a, a little personal story about the land heritage of the land I'm connected with in Southern Illinois, and then we'll have dis, uh, more of a Q and A discussion at the end. But certainly if you have questions at any time, uh, please type them in the chat or go ahead and unmute and, and ask us. Um, we find that that works extremely well. Um, so one of the things we know about transitioning uh, land, whether it be farmland or forest land from one generation to the next, is that it requires uh, planning and, and especially communication. Um, I, I worked in Oregon with, with a, a CPA who had helped many, many businesses transition, many, many landowners transition, both uh, farm and forest. And he said, one of the most important things, if there isn't communication at the front end, all of the tools, all of the legal tools that are used at the back end typically get undone and the, the people who are inheriting the property go ahead and do what they want. Um, and so he said this communication to have an understanding of what's desired and where the land should be going, what, what the heritage is, is, is extremely important. So during our presentation, you're gonna hear two stories of two very, very different pieces of property um, that have been transitioned from one generation to the next for over a hundred years. Um, Becky will tell one about a property on the Brule River in Wisconsin, and I'll tell a story about the farm that my mom grew up on in Southern Illinois. We're going on the fifth generation transitioning to the fifth generation. And from what, from what Amber tells me, to go three generations is very uncommon. So I was pleased to know that, that we've been able to transition that for so many years. Um, one of the things that, that you'll hear, some of the key points, and I'll summarize these at the end again, is that for this transition to work, and by that I mean what's successful is that the family and all people connected with the land know what's happening. And if circumstances change the plan, there, there's communication so that everybody is on the same page and there aren't hard feelings is, is really what I see as success. You really are looking for one, you know, to have this work out, there really needs to be one or more people that's intimately connected with the property someone who's got family at heart and the, and the other people who are involved with the property as well at heart, someone who has a vision and a desire to carry things forward. And um, then there's this ongoing communication. So this isn't a one and done and we have a family meeting and all this communication is complete. It's something that goes on. And Becky has often reminded me, it's, it's often those stories around the breakfast table. Um, the time spent out on the farm doing work with family, with the others that are involved that, that really make a difference. So we'll, you'll hear about the tools that we have for you to use that will help with family communication, some of the suggestions that I've found helpful within my family. Um, and we will provide some links uh, later on in, in the chat um, that will provide uh, some what I call essential land transition library materials, some worksheets that can be very helpful to you to use. Um, we will have some polls throughout so we can learn a little bit more about you and, and where you're at in this whole process. And so um, with that, um, I'll go ahead to um, the short video. Your land is part of your legacy. 
whatever drove you to purchase it. Oops, I'm sorry. We will start that again. A place to raise your family, beauty, privacy, an investment, something to pass on. The fact is, your land represents more than just a dollar value. There's an emotional attachment to it, not just for you, but probably for your family. What happens to your land is up to you. So there are some important decisions to make. Take the Millers. Bob Miller has always loved snowmobiling. Kay Miller loves birds and spending quiet mornings taking walks on their trails. Now, they're approaching retirement and thinking about what will happen to their land after they die. Who will own it? How will it be used? They'd like to preserve it and not have it fall into a developer's hands where it could be turned into a housing development. And they'd like to leave it to their kids. At the same time, they want to ensure that the value of the land is available to them if they need it in retirement and can be distributed equally among their children when they're gone. It sounds complicated, this business of making everyone happy. Unfortunately, for couples like the Millers, it can lead to indecision, inaction, and outcomes they don't want. Family arguments, the land being developed, even legal battles hard feelings and resentments that can linger for years. They've seen these decisions tear other families apart. What you may not know is that protecting your land is easier than you think. It's even possible to protect one portion of your land while allowing another portion to provide income or options for the kids. For example, Bob and Kay could place a conservation easement on the land, preventing future development and preserving its natural condition forever while also setting aside three house lots that can be sold in the future. The house lots can provide income if needed later in life or be given to the kids. They'll even get a tax deduction for donating the easement to a land trust or the community. Of course, this is just one option out of many that will allow you to pass your land on, meet your financial goals, and ensure it isn't used for something you don't want. Bob and Kay are exploring their options. You owe it to yourself and your heirs to explore your options, too. It's your land. Don't let it be the cause of fighting in your family. Take steps now to determine its future and your legacy. To start exploring your options, contact your local extension office today. You might be surprised at what you can do to ensure your legacy and just how straightforward the process can be. So with that, I, I want to thank you for joining us. I think we've got 36 people on, and um, I know that you have an interest in this topic. Uh, and, and again, thank you. And so um, this is where we'll have a poll. Um, and so if we could bring that poll up and people respond. And this is check all that apply. Mike, can you read those questions out for the folks that are joining us via sure. phone? Yeah, thank you for reminding me. The, for, the question is, is what is your attachment to the land? And it's a check all that apply and we have several choices. Family property has been in the family for more than one generation. We love farming and want to see the land farmed. We love the woodlands and want to see some of the land remain forested. Uh, family memories is the attachment. Uh, source of income is, is another. And then I also have the final one is other, and then I ask people to use the chat and type in whatever additional item that you might uh, have or think of as far as your attachment to the land. So we're still getting some a few responses in. Um, but just in general, um, we've got about 83% saying the family has been in the, the, the property has been in the family for more than one generation. Um, and if it's been in the, you know, go ahead and type in um, and, and we get one prevent development as the cities move closer, something that we heard in the video. Uh, love farming and want to see the land farmed, 42%. Love woodlands and want to see the, the land remain forested you know, we're, we're about 40%, about even. We want to, what, what we hear from people all the time is they want to keep this land working. They want to keep the farm going. They want to keep the woodlands providing those benefits that the woodlands have provided. That, that tends to be a, a universal across farm and forest as I've been teaching this 
the family memories uh, has come up at about 70 percent. Um, source of income is about 56 percent. Um, and, um, you know, the other I mentioned was prevent development as cities move closer. And I think that that becomes um, part of that. I want to keep the woodland woodlet, wooded or I want to keep the farm farm going. And so I'm going to go ahead and end the polling here. Um, and I'll just briefly share those results so you can go ahead and see the final results there. And thank, thank you for providing your input. Really appreciate that. And so, so this transition planning from one generation to the next, or from one owner to the next owner, if it's not an heir, um, is is also part of it. This is really a process, and I, I mentioned that at the beginning. The communication, it's it's not just something you do once. It's a process. It's it's those times sitting around the breakfast table. It's it's those times that we get to get get together to work out on the farm or to walk through the woods. Um, it it involves those types of activities. It involves documents, a will, maybe a trust, a limited li liability company. It involves different tools, conservation easements. I just learned that. In, in some states, uh, extension is helping people write letters to the future owners. So that becomes part of the documentation. I worked with an owner in Oregon where we developed a plan, a forest management plan for the property. And I said, you've got some great pictures, you know, photo albums from your property and the things that you have done to go ahead and, and manage it. What about putting all of that in a in a coffee table book and having that out for the grandkids when they come so that they can see what's gone on before? So it's tools like that that can be used for the future that, that help facilitate the passing of the heritage from one generation to the next. So what what do I mean exactly by by heritage? And and I'll just define that briefly. Heritage is something that's transmitted by or acquired from a predecessor. And so that can be traditions and beliefs about the property or about how you do things. It's, it's those stories that you pass from one generation to the next, and it's the way you care for the land. It's, it's that deep inside caring for the land. It can be the way you farm, but it, it's really based on who you are. It's how you feel about farming or about caring for the woodland. And, and I wanna emphasize these things transcend the, the facts of how we farm or how we take care of the woods and the knowledge about how we do things. And they really cut to the core of who we are. Oops, I jumped a slide. So we have another poll here and if we could bring this poll up. It looks like while we're doing that, Mike, we had somebody comment here when you were sharing your story. I'm the brother-in-law of four children, including wife, with a family farm still owned by parents. Okay. So brother-in-law, you've got four children, including wife, family still owned by parents. And as I go through my story, Al, I, I hope that my story will connect with some of the things that you might be feeling. Um, it's so important not just you know to include um, the immediate folks that are involved with the, the land transition, but also think about going beyond that um, to more distant relatives. And, and we've had to do that with, with the property that I'll talk about that we're going on the fifth generation now for, even though some of the family members that have an interest in the land and by that they use the land for hunting they use it for other purposes um, but don't own it and and we allow that because they're family um, i'll talk a little bit more about that toward the end of the presentation and so this poll i'll read this out um, what do you do to build a common sense of heritage uh, family social gatherings um, about almost 90 percent of you family meetings is about 30 percent and those meetings are, are more of the formal things, and I've already emphasized some of these informal things are, are 
probably as important or more important um, to do you know continuously. Discuss finances, very important. Uh, family participates in the farming. Um, enjoy the property as a family. Um, maybe walk the fields, pick the berries, take time to relax and plan for the future. I, I, I can't emphasize that enough, I think, is taking some time just to have fun with family in the context of the property. Um, and anything else come in? Um, not right now. I'm going to go ahead and end this poll and um, share the results with you. And thank you for sharing your results. Um, and and we found that the, these family social gatherings are so important. Becky, do you have any comments on that? I mean, just that exactly what you've indicated. It's so important just to um, have people feel that there's that connection. And of course, there are many different ways to uh, have that happen. And we'll explore some as well. Okay. And so um, with that, Becky, we're at the point of talking about communication tools. And I'm going to pass this over to you. And um, you just tell me when to advance the slides and I'll, I'll do so. But Okay, but, uh, thank you, Mike. So you may ask why communication is so important. And we may view communication differently. Uh, commonly, it's the verbal or talking, but it can also be the nonverbal. And just think of those individuals closest to you, how you know them so well, you can pick up on how they're feeling perhaps whether it be positive or challenging, whatever, you know those individuals close to you. And you can read a lot of messages in that. But basically, it's to take the time to find out the hopes and dreams and where it fits, perhaps, to continue some of what you find out in the hope and dream category. We all know that things happen, life's changes, may reflect different directions, but at least that awareness. Also, an opportunity through communication to share ideas and stories. And I'll share in a moment uh, just briefly about my family, relatives, and a cabin that they have, and an example from that. But passing those stories down from generation to generation builds that sense of importance and belonging. And then also fostering family relationships uh, just through connecting, however that is, building upon those inner relationships that we have in our immediate family and perhaps extended family members. And of course, reaching that family legacy. And one colleague mentioned that it could be very, very different um, as maybe it intended to be from day one, just because of life changes in who might be members of the family, in their goals that may have changed, et cetera. But it's so important to communicate, to find out some of this information. Okay. Oops, there we go. So the key is ideally early planning and communication because we find out so much. We can find out, for example, different ideas of what fairness is. And think of the siblings, if you had them growing up in that family of origin. Um, it's amazing how you could maybe view one situation one way and perhaps a sibling didn't get that at all from the situation and viewed it quite differently as an example. A key is to talk about what fair means. Again, it could take on many different meanings. To ideally make decisions. So to think through the who, what, when, how, and what if situations. A timeline is so critical if let's say an individual or family really want action. We all know how it is if we don't say when something might be done. And also to take a look at areas of agreement and disagreement. To be forewarned in well advance before critical decisions are being made. And then the last point on this slide is 
to really communicate to reduce misunderstandings and conflict. Uh, you may be surprised at finding out some things that you had no clue about with how someone may feel as an example. Okay. And a key piece here is to avoid inaccurate assumptions. How often we may in living day to day have an idea about something or how someone may view an issue or whatever and find out we're actually not accurate at all. And so those things are very common. But the key here is to identify property or items that have special meaning. What are those property items, et cetera? And they found a parallel between titled and non-titled property in some of the information that we're talking about. Why something might be important. Who should receive an item or the property and why? And to discuss a sense of place. And that is so interesting. I remember being at one of our workshops, Mike, where an individual shared about her sense of place, a spot on the property that was so important to her. It was when she was upset, she would always go to this one tree and wanted to sit underneath it and just chill. She called it just chilling. It was her spot. And it allowed her time to think and reflect and she didn't want to lose that because she grew up with that through many years. So to her, a tree, a special tree was a sense of place. But how exciting to be able to actually share those stories and meanings with different generations. They would share with their children and such. So the key is involvement. And Believe it or not, even if individuals do not receive what they would like, ideally, if they're involved, there is an increased perception of satisfaction. And so a key piece to consider, okay? There are a couple of communication tools that we often share with our groups that can help you get the conversation started. And one would be the heirloom scale that you'll see shortly. We also have a resource with the University of Minnesota titled, Who Gets Grandma's Yellow Pie Plate? And that incorporates a workbook and a CD. And also getting the conversation started that Mike, you were going to share a couple comments about that down the line. Yes. Okay. Here is an example of the heirloom scale. And you could do this in different ways. It could be a handout that you give the members of your family. Um, we made actually a big poster of it and put it on the wall. And I'll explain how to do that or post-its. Uh, for example, the members of your family, if they use post-its, they would write their name or initials or whatever and place it on the poster indicating where they land on that continuum in regard to on the far left, my property is one of the financial assets in my portfolio and nothing more. And then all the way to the right, my property is a priceless family heirloom to be protected at all costs. And we had whole families participating, taking their post-it note and placing it at various numbers on that continuum. And I still remember, Mike, in Grand Rapids, we had a family that brought 17 members of their family with them to the workshop. And their post-it notes were all over the board. And I still remember looking at the facial expressions, how surprised some of the members were to find out that, what a shock, maybe so-and-so wasn't interested in the land. Someone else was extremely interested and some might have landed in the middle, but what a tool. And one of our members said they brought it for a holiday and had their members fill out a worksheet on it, you know, as a jump start for conversations. So it could be used in different ways, but it's titled the heirloom scale. Becky, if I can jump in just really yes, quickly. Yes, please. 
for folks that use the heirloom scale, it's important to look at this as a communication tool. You're, you're, really, you're not trying to get the whole family to one point on this scale. You're really using it to find out what people are thinking and recognize that what people are thinking changes with sometimes the mood they're in, um, what's happened recently, and, and, and it's really a conversation starter. I've used this in, in my family to help get conversation going around the property that we have in Southern Illinois. And it, it's been very helpful to see what people are thinking and it's brought out quickly um, and helped us understand how to go ahead and transition to the fifth, fifth uh, generation. Thank you, mm -hmm. Becky. Yeah, thank you, Mike, for the comments. And just to note, it's kind of a non-threatening tool initially, just to kind of get a feel for the differences and similarities. Okay. And then I mentioned already that we do have that tool, Grandma's Yellow Pie Plate, the workbook, and also the CD um, that can help jumpstart conversations. Okay. okay, and we've got these in the uh, chat so that you can grab the uh, links out of chat. Okay. And so, Becky, um, you want me to go ahead and talk about this or you want to? Sure. Yeah, go okay. ahead. Um, the Getting the Conversation Going worksheets, um, there are links for these here. This is a little more detailed tool than the heirloom scale. It gets into fairness issues. It talks about how to manage the property, you know, what your thoughts are about farming or taking care of the woodland. It, it talks about, um, you know, that, that process. So there's really three parts to this and there's multiple questions in each part. Um, there are paper worksheets that you can use and download. Load. There's a discussion guide that goes with it. The discussion guide is very short, um, but it will help you guide a discussion with your family. And then there's this Qualtrics survey version of it that you can go online. We, we don't take any personal information from you as you fill it out, but you get a, basically a report from these series of about 16 questions that all of the family members could go ahead and fill this out. And then you could come together and, and talk about um, where, the, where the differences are and how people feel about these different things. So this is a tool that was developed over the last couple of years with the, the farm transition team and, and with the forestry transition team. So I encourage you to go ahead and, and take advantage of this. Absolutely. And the one thing I'll add here, Mike, these are a bunch of extremely useful links with some great information. If you aren't able to capture these all right now for the folks that are listening in, we're gonna send out all these links tomorrow in the email along with the recording. So you'll see there in the chat, if you can't grab them all right now, no worries. You'll also have access to them tomorrow morning. Great, thank you, Amber. Okay, so we promised you a couple of stories. Yes, Becky. and I'll just briefly highlight here. Thank you, Mike. This is um, in my family, the Swanson cabin that's on the Brule River in Wisconsin. And it's uh, one that has been in the family since 1929. So generations of four plus generations have visited, spent summers here um, to give you the context, okay? Okay, you can go to the next, thank you. Okay. It's you, can, oh, one back. One back, yeah. there we go. The river. Thank you, Mike. You can see that it, the land and the uh, river are very close together. You could never build like that today. But the big dilemma that they found out in their family, the issue through conversation, was a big ordeal on who would be able to stay what weeks during the summer and share this area and experience. And the Members of the family are very close and have shared stories and activities on the land for generations, a lot of canoeing, et cetera. So that is the big, big decision, who would receive the cabin and then the use of the cabin. A lot of memories. Okay, next one. Okay. 
conversations were mentioned, and this is just so rich with an environment of sharing through all the generations. There's many, many relatives that are scattered throughout the U.S. And the issue came about when my dad's um, distant cousin actually was the one that purchased the cabin in 1929. It ends up being it's on the Brule State Forest. So actually, it's what they call a lifetime lease. So no one really owns it in current our day and age, but it's a lifetime lease as long as descendants are still able to utilize the area. And there are many, and I was amazed. Reunions that I'm invited to every now and then. So a lot of memories, um, issues, and the need for communication. Special place to many people. So looking at all of this, um, I found one note of humor real quick. Most wanted to spend their time staying in the old cabin versus a newer one that they built a little bit up the hill. So this environment didn't have running water. This was like the prize. They worked it out and they ended up having meetings and um, schedules is how they worked with it. So I wanted to share that with you in the, as an example of land, problem solving and communication and coming up with an agreement. Okay. So possible action steps. You could view the Who Gets Grandma's Yellow Pie Plate DVD. You could complete the heirloom scale. There are some worksheets in Grandma's Yellow Pie Plate that talk about determining values and goals and all kinds of worksheets like fairness, et cetera. And it's important to take time to think about your hopes and dreams and goals and a family meeting, as I mentioned, that worked in the Swanson family. But the key is you never really know someone until you share an inheritance. Sometimes there are those surprises that come out and you wonder, oh my goodness, you know, where did that come from? So it's important, next slide, to remember to tell the stories, to communicate, and the land memory, memories, <clears throat> excuse me, that can proceed from generation to generation, and to involve family members and others in activities on the land and build those relationships. Becky, thank you. <clears throat> so um, that brings us to the the second story, and and this is the the story of one family's farm. Um, it's it's the farm that that I'm most associated with, um, the one where my mom grew up. Um, it's it's going on five generations, uh, maybe six in our family. And to give you some context of where this is, um, this is in Southern Illinois. Um, if people are familiar with Mount Vernon, it's, it's the intersection of Interstate 64 that runs from St. Louis over through Indiana um, and I-57, Interstate 57, that would go on down um, to uh, Kentucky from Chicago. So this is in very much the southern quarter, part of the quarter of the state of Illinois. Um, and I've got a picture of the, the, the woodland here. Um, the, this woodland and this, this land, the soils are, are very rich. Um, the, this is very good for growing black walnut in this part of the world. And um, the trees grow fairly fast. Um, and and um, it's been farmed for at least the mid 1800s. Um, I do want to say that uh, we're looking at, again, four generations of our family ownership. Um, the, the reason it's been in the family for four generations is there's been continued interest by the family in keeping this in farm and keeping it working. Um, there's been a, someone with a connection to the land who's been managing that process, not always the one farming it, but managing it. Um, 
and there's been a sharing of the plans of the thoughts of the costs uh, and the hopes and dreams and I've been brought into it because I've received a forestry degree at University of Illinois and there's there's 50 acres of forest land on on the piece that I'm most interested in um, and so I I have taken on the responsibility for managing the forest land um, and so we'll get into it and I'll show you some air photos here in a minute but um, as with many of you the, these things can be much more complex than what I'll present here and I just want to say that one of the complexities we have on this land in southern Illinois is the um, piece that belonged to my great grandparents the 80 acres um, the mineral rights for that in fact the mineral rights for all of the land were separated from the land many years ago and so the mineral rights on the 80 that i'm associated with um, have gone to all of the benbrook family descendants and there there are somewhere between 50 and 100 benbrook family descendants scattered throughout the united states and and there have only distant memories of the physical land um, and the stories about it and so um, that you know I want to recognize that that uh, all of these things are complex and there's more complexities than than um, you know if you think about them all at once it's hard to handle so I'd like to try to deal with one thing at a time and with this story I'm going to tell you it's just looking at the surface land and, and how it's managed and so um, the story starts with Lily and Joe Russ those were my grandparents uh, it's my mom's parents and the bits and pieces of the story come from conversations that I heard around the breakfast table or around the dinner table um, about the farm I have read some title documents so I've gone back through what public records there are about the land to learn a piece together history of the family the genealogy to look at that and so that's where um, my connection with the heritage of this land it, it also comes from me being on the land working to remove invasive species from the woods and talking with the uh, farmer that we share crop with and finding out what what his concerns are what his hopes are what what things he's seeing out on the land as he farms it um, trying to better understand how how that farming and we grow corn and beans um, you know what's that like you know my background's forestry not farming so I try to learn as much as I can and we have a very very good relationship with that farmer um, and I think that's essential and those conversations we talk about need to go beyond the family and and especially with those people who are actively um, farming it if, if you're a, a sharecropper a lease arrangement um, so my message is is to encourage that conversation encourage about the conversation about the heritage of the, of the farm of the family of the of the land you know how did how was it acquired who owned it who who were the neighbors how how did they get involved with it how did they help um, what's that history how, how do you work to reduce erosion how do you work to increase yield um, you know my my grandfather he the, this farm was was very much um, what I would call a small traditional farm where he, he raised hogs cattle chickens uh, corn um, and when we would go down and visit typically we would be down there at least twice a year for at least a week at a time um, I would go out and help with chores in the morning before breakfast um, breakfast was a was one of the largest meal if not the largest meal of the day uh, my grandfather would have been up and working probably already four or five hours before breakfast um, but I can remember going out and collecting eggs from the the chicken coop um, going out to the the barn uh, getting some corn that had been put there you know previous season and and shelling it in the hand corn sheller so we, we'd crank it and then shell the corn for the chickens um, and so those are some of the the things that I recall from my grandfather and that was back in the early 60s that we were doing that um, so at some point I think I'll write all this story down and, and I'll work with some of the family members to get this written but for right now it's uh, something that that I 
have in notes um, I have recorded on an iPhone, and that's a wonderful tool if you're having these family conversations to go ahead and, and, and grab your phone and just record the conversation um, and then go back to it at some time. So I'll go on to the next slide here. And so this, this property, um, my grandparents began farming, I think in about 1916. Now at least 1916 is when, when Joe Russ married Lily Russ. And uh, Joe Russ's background, he was from this area in Southern Illinois. My, my grandmother grew up on this property. Um, her grandparents owned pieces of it. Um, and he had a carpentry background, but I also believe in 16 that he was began farming uh, with my great grandparents at that time. And in 1929, he bought 80 acres from his, his in-laws mm -hmm. for $1,400. Now, the time between 1916 and 1929, part of that time, the family had moved to Montana to homestead, and they found that they, that, that, that wasn't working as well as they had hoped, and so they moved back to the, uh, the family land in, in Illinois. Um, so this is the 80. The 76.01 acres, it's, it was 80. There were four acres taken out of it. And I'll talk about how that happens over time um, with this piece of property. All of the maroon areas that were maroon on this were part of the original farm, which was 280 acres. So um, the, the next 80 that my grandfather purchased was when my great grandparents passed away in, in 1929 and they bought that for 1400 acres, $1,400. These other three forties here were purchased from adjacent farmers or, or adjacent neighbors. And I, I have not been able to uncover the title documents for these um, yet, but, but I'm working on that. And so um, my grandfather uh, worked the farm until 1965 and he passed away. And at that time there was a, um, I believe it was uh, sharecropped with a local farmer his, whose name is Kit. Uh, Kit remained sharecropping this land until the late 1980s, early 1990s when he passed away. But there was a relationship there between the two. Um, and I can remember going down to the farm and visiting and, and Kit was always part of the breakfast discussions, or nearly always. He would come in at least two or three days a week, sit down, talk about what was happening on the farm and what was happening on the land. Um, important is that um, during this period after my grandmother died in 1972, uh, there was the Russ Family Trust was formed. Now there was discussions, and I was too young to know what these were prior to that, to go ahead and use that tool to keep the family together. And there were five siblings. So my aunt Hazel, who is the oldest, um, lived in this house right here on the corner. And I think um, I can annotate that and just draw a red circle around it right there. Um, that's where she lived. And she purchased four acres from the, um, from the trust to go ahead and have the house there. Um, that was built actually in 1962, so they, they, they bought it over time from the family. Um, so as, as things happened, um, the trusts last 21 years, and after the trust dissolved, um, they went into a partnership. It was called the Russ Family Partnership to go ahead and keep this land in farming so that, so that this would remain productive ground. Um, and I mentioned this was um, corn and beans um, is what we grow on, on these acres. But in, in the, it would have been in 1993, about the time of the partnership started, my aunt Arlene, who's the youngest, needed to sell 40 acres because she needed some, some money. And my aunt lived in Chicago, that aunt Arlene is in Chicago. Um, and so she sold this 40 to a farmer from the just adjacent to the property in the north um, 
40 acres went to my uncle Joe who lived in Arizona and when he passed away in 2003 this this 40 went to his two sons and his sons kept it for a couple of years um, one son lives in Pennsylvania one lives in Oregon and they decided to sell it and they sold it to a farmer who who farms land from the south of us and that farmer has become the person that we share crop with now and so that's mark miller mark miller um, is someone that i talk to frequently on the phone now um, typically uh, once every other month at least and when i'm down there visiting we spend time together to hear about what is happening with the farming what his views are what erosion problems are going on do we need some grassy waterways um, and he's interested in learning more about the forest as well so it's a it's a very good working relationship and that conversation uh, becomes very very important um, this 40 here where it says 28.85 acres it's 28.85 that was sold to mark miller a couple of years ago my aunt hazel who's the oldest is still alive she's 99 she doesn't live on the property anymore but she still lives in the area down in southern illinois but um, her two sons passed away um, and their kids now have an interest in the farm and these other properties so the pro original house property where my aunt lived and this property about eight acres adjacent to it are now my her great grandkids own those pieces um, so we see this farm starting to get divided up. Um, this small four acres here was my other cousin. Um, after my Aunt Martha died, um, he, he inherited this property and then um, he needed some money as well. He sold the 76 to Mark Miller, the people person we share crop with, and he kept four acres. So at one time we actually tried and discussed trying to put this back together in a limited liability company. And the conversations were going well, but circumstances and health issues of different people kind of overtook the conversations. We still have good conversations. I, I keep in touch with my aunt's grandkids um, because um, Jeremy, the person who owns this piece, hunts the 80 that this blue is the piece that I'm associated with. Um, We've got 30 acres of crop and the rest is, is forest. Um, and we're actively managing the forest, working with the Natural Resource Conservation Service and have a, um, a federal program to where we're doing timber stand improvement and remove, removal of invasives. And, and the uh, farmer that we work with has said that he's very willing to help with that. Um, and that many times uh, doesn't charge us for that assistance. So. Um, we're in a very good position to go ahead and, and begin talking with and have begun talking with. Um, my dad has this piece now. It's in a trust, the piece in blue. Um, and so there's, I have two siblings, so there's three of us. And then there, there are, um, it would be six six kids would be involved and we're beginning to talk about how does this transition from this point my brother's in california my sister's in chicago i'm in minnesota uh, i have a very strong interest in in managing the forest um, again good situation the taxes are low enough that we can pay for the taxes with the 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 funds that we get from sharecropping with the farmer and we're all happy with the arrangement uh, we feel good about the type of farming that the farmer's doing. And, and this has all come down to, um, you know, these conversations that we've had over the years with the family, you know, around the table. Uh, it's come down to using some of the tools that we've given you um, in, in our family. Found out that my brother said, yeah, it's okay to keep it as long as it doesn't cost him any money. With my sister, she wants to keep it. The, the heirloom scale she's like this is an heirloom i want to keep it at all costs she has no money to contribute so that so it's got to produce income for us to keep it and so we know those things going into it and so we can begin planning around that for the transition to the fifth fifth uh, generation so with that i think um I, you know if there's any questions uh i can take them now in chat 
I see my my scribble shows through on the next slide. Maybe it doesn't on yours, but it does on mine. Um, this is another poll question. You know, what is your heritage? Um, and it's you know it's it's the way you farm or care for the land, how you feel about farming, stories to pass from one generation to the next. You know, how are you passing this on to the next? Uh, generation, or go ahead and type in the chat if there's if there's something. Okay, we're we're uh, we're seeing that people, you know, heritage to them is 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 it's all of these things. Um, you know, how you feel about farming. I didn't put how you feel about forestry, but uh, you go ahead and type in. We know that many farms in Minnesota have forest on them, ab about 80%. Um, often it's just a piece in the back, and, and that's often how it was on, on the farm in Southern Illinois. It was just a piece in the back, although my uncle was, was very interested in, in some of the, the trees and, and did a lot of work to plant walnut um, over on that 80 that that I'm now associated with, um, and I work very closely with uh, with my cousins to go ahead and keep planting trees and removing invasives. So, okay, I'll end polling here. Ah, I like this. I, we have a question come in. Great examples of things working out pretty well. How about when communication breaks down and families can't agree? Becky, I'd like you to jump in on this, but I, I'm, I'm going to, um, you know, we, we've been really fortunate. Um, we don't always agree on things. We, we come from very different backgrounds. I'm, I grew up in Chicago. The folks that are most associated with the land right now would be my, my, grand, my, gr my aunt's grandkids, and they grew up in Southern Illinois. The, the, there's a big difference in how we see the world, um, but we've been able to talk through things that we have in common um, and find those things that we have in common. Most importantly with, with uh, Jeremy, the person who owns that eight acres, he's very in, interested in hunting on that property. Um, that area produces some of the biggest uh, bucks in Illinois. Uh, it's adjacent to a 10,000 acre mm -hmm conservation area and um, we've been able to um, have conversation around some common interests in, in how do we care for the land so that it still produces produces the deer that he likes to hunt um, and he knows that we could go ahead and lease the land to a hunting club um, that would destroy family uh, and the family connections, even though they're not, you know, those are getting to be distant relatives at this point, I feel it's important to, to, to take the effort to um, keep those bridges there. Um, but when you can't and things break down, how, how do you keep going? Becky, do you have some thoughts on that? Um, well, first of all, to try some of the tools such as what we've shared today. Um, and see how it goes. There may be some common ground discovered that you didn't know would exist. That's like the first trial. But if uh, everything goes south, I know some families who have hired some outside facilitators to come in like to a family meeting um, and again, work to find that common ground and some common goals and what might be done in the future. So it's, a, it's kind of experimental where you start with some basic tools and see how it goes. And then there are some individuals um, that do offer assistance. I know Mike and I, with a land transfer workshop, we worked with an attorney who was great at bringing forth just some you know ideas to think about and meeting with families and such. So it's kind of that discovery. There's no one fits all solution, but um, any other thoughts, Mike, on that one? Yeah, I, I want to go ahead and I think this is a great transition. You know, what advice do we have for a farm um, property and family that's still being farmed by father and son and there's a daughter? 
One of the things we've heard both from the CPA I worked with in Oregon and from our attorney is that mm -hmm. all of the people involved in the property need to have a role in that property. They need to have a job. And so if it's a father and son farming, what is the daughter's job? Is, is, it, is it scheduling time to, to, to you know, if, if the daughter doesn't live there to, to visit? Is, is, it, is it keeping books? Is, is there, you know, what are the roles? Um, if, you know, that becomes really, really important um, for everybody to have a role um in in this property and feel that they're part of it so that things can move forward another comment we have farmer lender mediation program in minnesota can be used for family communication great comment um yeah yeah that's great it. is there anything else i know we're right about at one o'clock amber I think that those are the questions that we have had. Um, and I know that you shared out your heritage poll and folks were able to see that. And then some more links here that we will make sure and get to everyone. I'll also include the farmer lender mediation link when we send out tomorrow. Um, with that, those folks that need to go because it's one o'clock, thank you so much for joining us and we will see you on December 3rd. Um, Mike and Becky, I'd like to thank you so much for being here. And if you all have time, we will stick around for about five or 10 more minutes if there are questions that come in. Um, otherwise, thank you so much. I think that this was really insightful for everyone to get to hear, not just about some of those communication techniques and understanding heritage, but also two real life examples of how complex it can get. Um, and I know from conversations I've had with folks, there is no simple transition, right? How you keep it simple, have one kid that wants to take over the farm, one kid that wants to take over the woodland, um, but often that does not happen. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing your personal stories with us. Thanks everyone for being here. Uh, to lots of great information, lots of uh, incredible resources provided. So I will make sure and include all of those tomorrow in the email we send out. If you have questions, please stick around, more than happy to answer them. Otherwise, have a great Thanksgiving. And if you're on the phone and you have a question, you can hit star six to unmute. So Amber, I know that, uh, you know, the, the next one you already mentioned, December 3rd, Rob Holcomb is coming, business mm -hmm. structure and land ownership. I, I kind of want to follow up for if, if some of the folks are still on the line with, with uh, you know, if you've got more than, you know, three or four kids and, and you're trying to figure out how to do things and a couple of them just really aren't interested in the farm. Um, there are some structures that can be used to go ahead and buy those, buy those heirs out so that they're still not, you know, they're still getting something from the inheritance while the other folks can remain farming. Some of the some of the saddest stories I heard about though are the case where um, you've got father and son farming, and the father dies, and the mom decides that the daughters ought to have some some role in this, and and the whole thing falls apart, and the the person who put all that sweat equity into the farm uh, leaves it ends up with nothing, um, or the other you know the other siblings you know it it you know having keeping these conversation going and and knowing at least what the interest of the heirs are the siblings are is helpful to beginning these conversations and and making plans so that everybody is treated equitably um, it may not be getting equal shares of the land it may be something else yeah i think that's a good discussion mike that sometimes fair isn't or sometimes fair isn't equal right especially when we talk about sweat labor and there are other resources that we'll talk about continuing forward that can be used to you know provide for those that are um, non-farming heirs or if you're a woodland owner those that aren't going to maintain the land um, and that communication piece comes in if you communicate this is why i did it and this is why i believe it's fair still, 
because the person that's going to inherit the farm is doing all of this work and lives here or the person that's inheriting the woodland is doing it, that can really help clear the air. And by not having those conversations, uh, sometimes it's easier, right? Because we avoid the conflict, but what it's doing is it's postponing it till later down the road. And it's postponing it till after perhaps that parent isn't here anymore. And then we have this conflict while grieving um, or we leave it to our spouse that is still living to figure out. And those can be really tough as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's important to begin to see where people are at and what, what people, what are their hopes, you know, and it's often hard for the heirs to say anything. Um, I know if I have any regrets on, on the farm property is that I didn't get more involved in some of the finance decisions that didn't result in any bad things that I didn't but it would have helped me better to understand things as my aunt transitioned out of the role of managing the property and as we as we now work directly with that share you know that that farmer to share crop the farm and, and we've gone sharecropping rather than lease um, because of that relationship um, it, it sometimes you think it's it's got to be all about the money, but for us it's really all about the relationship and how that person that we're working with cares for the land. Um, you know, if it, if it wasn't for the effort that that farmer puts in and treats it like his own ground, and he does, I've been on his ground. He he's he he owns three thousand acres in the area. Um, I, I think he does a good job. There's things that I didn't like about how he farms, but I've learned that uh, you, you can't avoid all the erosion and all of that when you're farming, um, but you can do things to go ahead and protect protect the soil. Looking here, if folks have questions, feel free to drop them into the chat box. Um, Amber, there was a chat sent to me, there will be a recording link sent out, right? Um, okay. 